Hello and welcome to Treasure in Every Verse. I'm your host, author and Bible teacher, Kevin Madison. Thank you for joining us today. Well, folks, we're back tonight for our original uh, uh, video and Bible uh, study that, that we were planning to do. We did one earlier uh, due to some comments and questions that I had. I felt it necessary to go on and answer that. And we did. So if you want to go see the one uh, that we did earlier today, it was about uh, can a believer, a true born again believer, continue living in a lifestyle of sin? And basically because of, of grace and the, the way uh, the gospel is actually taught, Paul, when he was teaching it, there were some people going around and said, Paul, uh, was teaching people that they can sin, that they had a license to sin. Well, I'll get accused of doing the same thing. Of course, I don't because Paul didn't as well. And neither did God. But because you don't understand salvation, well, some people didn't understand salvation, hence the comments and the questions that came. So we answered that. You can go check those videos out. It is posted on uh, Facebook and it's going to be posted later tonight on the YouTube channel if you want to go over there and look at that as well. All right. So what are we doing tonight? Well, last time we came, we, we were talking about not lifting a verse out of its context. And I took you through one that is very popular that people take out of its context all the time. Which one is that? Well, 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. So I will walk you through that. We're not going to double back to that. But if you missed that episode and you want to go see that, go ahead and take a look at that. But tonight we're going to move on, folks. We're going to move into... Uh, some of the very important things that you need to keep in mind when you're going through the Bible. There are, there are covenants all over the place, okay? There's covenants that I don't have listed here on the board. There's covenants that God made with Adam and Eve. There's covenant that God made with Noah. So and that's, that's covenants everywhere, all right? I'm not going to go through all the different covenants. That's not what the study is about. But... When it comes to taking a verse out of context, and it comes to uh, these key three covenants, what is this, folks? Essentially, what we see here is the covenants that God made with Israel. I, I can't express enough to you. Because people just get frustrated with this. Why does it bother people that God chose Israel? I don't know. Is it because, I don't know. The, the only thing is demonic. <laughs> I can't just be straight, straightforward here. It's demonic, folks. If you hate Israel, if you hate the Jews, now I'm not saying every Jew is saved because they're not. The Bible doesn't teach that. And we all know, as a matter of fact, that they're not all saved. As a matter of fact, most at this point in time are not saved. Why? Because the Bible makes it clear that God has allowed blindness to come upon Israel. It came from him. Why? So that you and I, the Gentiles, can get saved. Do you realize that Jesus Christ, if Israel, when Jesus came, had accepted him as Messiah, what would have happened? We would still be in our sins. Christ would have never went to the cross. God, in his great mercy and wisdom and knowledge, allowed Israel to be blind so that we can have salvation. Folks, just read the book of Romans. Starting chapter 9 through 11, God explains everything about Israel you need to know in those three short chapters in Romans 9. If you're a Jew watching this and you're wondering, what in the world is Kevin talking about? Well, Israel, uh, Isaiah talked about it. That's what Paul was quoting. Go back and read, read uh, the, the prophet Isaiah. It clearly shows you that God blinded Israel. That what's going on with Israel is a punishment uh, that was spoken about by Daniel the prophet. Go read the book of Daniel. It's in that book too. 
Go read the book of Jeremiah. It's in that book. Go read second, go read first and second chronicles or second chronicles, really. It's in that book as well. Go, oh, by the way, while you're reading, go in Second Kings. It's in there too. Oh. Go back to Exodus, especially uh, Leviticus chapter 26. It's in there too. Then the later chapters of Deuteronomy. Folks, it's all over the book. <laughs> you can't get past it. The last chapter of Joshua, I mean, you cannot get past what happened to Israel. God did it. You're looking for somebody to blame. God stood up and he said, hey, I'm the one. I blind Israel. Why did you do that, God? Because I'm a God of mercy. I'm a God I love in kindness. And I want to show it to others besides my people Israel. And by the way, the Bible makes it clear. The scriptures make it clear. The Torah makes it clear that there will only be a remnant of Jews saved. It was never God's intent to save all Israel. He will eventually. You're going to see it after the great tribulation. But even from here to then, it's going to be a small number of Jews that come to salvation, folks. Just like that, it's going to be a small number of Gentiles that come to salvation. Salvation is very narrow and it's very limited. Jesus described it this way. He says there's two roads. Y'all remember that? One room is straight. And that gate is now. The other one is broad and wide. Jesus said that one of these leads to salvation. One leads to hell. Which one do you think leads to salvation? According to the scriptures, I don't need your opinion. You don't need mine. Just from right here. Oh, and by the way, he says on this road, there's uh, two kinds of people. Okay. There's the few. And there's the many. Which one you think goes to heaven? Which one goes to hell? Again, I'm not interested in your opinion. I ask that as a rhetorical question because it's the few. Who said this? This came out of the mouth of the God of the universe, the one who is saving people. Jesus Christ, the creator, who knows all things, who knows his own sheep, says straight, narrow, few going to heaven. Broad, wide, many going to hell. Now, you can argue with that all day. It doesn't make a difference. He is God. His word is going to stand. You don't have to like it. Change it, if you can. So I don't know where people get all this stuff about, we're going to, the gospel is going to go out into the world and half the world, or 
Almost all the world is going to come to Christ. If that comes true, then throw the book away. Because Jesus is a liar. It's not going to come true. You have been deceived. And if that's what you're teaching, then more than likely you're not even saved. Why? Because you are not a lover of truth. God's word is truth. He says those who believe in him become lovers of truth. And you'll be telling people the truth. I'm not bashful. I'm not ashamed to tell people that most are going to hell. Where did I get that from? You think I made that number up? I didn't make it up, folks. Look, in Matthew, you guys have that picture. I'm going to erase this. In Matthew chapter 13, Jesus himself gives a parable. It's the parable of the soils. Soils is another word for hearts. Or spirits, human spirits he's talking about. Human spirits, the heart. You know what he says? There's four types. Four kinds of soil. You remember what he called them? One is good. The other is hard. The third thorns. The fourth rock. You know what he said? Only one of the four goes to heaven. What's the ratio? 25%. Who said that? Did he exaggerate? Did he tell the truth? Or was he a complete idiot? I speak as a person. He's no idiot. He's God. He is the truth. He's the living word of God. Truth personified as a person in the Lord Jesus Christ. The scripture says, let God be true and every man a liar. So if you're going around telling people that any and everybody can be preached to and come to Christ. You lied to them. We preach to everybody because we have no clue who is saved today. I don't know, folks, if you ask me today if anybody's saved, my answer to you is I have no clue. All I can tell you about is myself. I have no clue who else besides me. Now, I know there's, I know there's others. It's 25% out there in the world's population of 8 billion people. Now, but I have no clue. So we've been instructed, we being that part of that 25%, to preach it to everybody. God is going to make sure that that 25% come to him. Can I show you something interesting? Watch this from Paul. Look at what Paul says. Uh, <laughs> and this is, this is tough. This is tough for, for people to take. And I, can, I get it. I understand it because everybody wants everybody else uh, to be saved. I mean, I, I do. I, there, there's nothing 
I wouldn't do to, to, to get everybody saved. Now, I want to show you what Paul said. So, so bear with me. And we're going to come right back to this. Look at what he says. And you tell me, maybe Paul was mistaken. Maybe he, he was dreaming when he wrote this and, you know, he just didn't record it properly. I doubt it. <laughs> I doubt it very seriously, folks. I'm being facetious, okay? Please don't take that serious. But I don't, I don't play with the word of God like that. I'm just, I'm just b being a, a bit facetious tonight to uh, get, get you to, to, to get what I'm saying here. Okay. Look at this, folks. Look at what, what Paul wrote here. Ah. So he goes, remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David. How important do you think this is? If that part right there, just this little, this is how narrow the scriptures are. If Jesus Christ isn't the seed of David, then all this book is a lie. If his great 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 grandfather isn't David, the whole book is a lie. He was raised from the dead. If Jesus Christ wasn't raised from the dead, Paul said, "We of above all people, most miserable." But look how now, according to Paul's gospel. Paul said, I got the gospel from straight from Jesus Christ. I didn't get it from some man. He said, the Lord gave me the gospel. For which I suffer trouble. Listen, as an evil do. Why? Because he was preaching the gospel the way it's supposed to be preached. Even to the point of change. Let me tell you something. If people in America... I'm just going to speak for America because I don't live outside of America, but I do know what's happening here in America. And for those of you who live outside of the country, you may be witnessing the same thing. If we were being put in prison for the gospel, boy, that would clear out a lot of churches. They don't want suffering. They don't teach suffering, trouble. They don't want that. They teach, if that's you, the way you're living, then you can't, be, you can't be a believer. Why? Because God always delivered a believer. Well, Paul was in chains. But the word of God is not. Therefore, because I, listen, because of this gospel, because of this gospel, I am suffering trouble. Being falsely accused of being an evildoer, falsely, accused. Where I'm in jail. In jail. Paul says, therefore, I, Paul, I endure that. What is Paul enduring? He endures being in chains. He endures being falsely accused of being an evildoer. Paul endured these things. Now watch. I endured all these things. All these things. Why, Paul? For. That's my reason. The sake, the sake of the elect. Everything Paul went through, even going to jail, I endured 
for the sake of everybody, saving the world. <laughs> you haven't read the Bible. Paul said, I only do it for the elect. What elect? The 25%. The remnant of Israel and the remnant of the Gentiles. Paul said, I do it for the sake of the elect. Wait a minute. Why, why, Paul? That. You want to know why? That. Day. Who's the day? Who's the day? The day is the elect. That day also may obtain something. What is it, Paul? What is it that you want these elect whom you endure all things for to the point of being changed, to the point of being called an evil doer because you're preaching this gospel. Who are you preaching it to? And what is it that you want them to attain? I want them to attain. Kevin? Salvation. What? Wait a minute. You're supposed to be preaching that gospel to everybody. I do. You're supposed to be telling everybody to come to Jesus. I do. But most of them think I'm an evildoer. They even put me in chains. No matter. I'm willing to endure that. And everything else they can throw my way. Why? For the sake of the elect. Not the world. That day. The elect. The elect. May obtain salvation. Folks, who's going to obtain salvation? The elect. What elect? That 25% that Jesus talked about in Matthew 13. That remnant of Israel talked about through all the, throughout all the Bible. The remnant of Gentiles talked about throughout the Bible. Delight. Those are not my words. I did not write the book. You may not like that. It doesn't matter. That's what it's going to be. Why? Because that's what's written. You don't have to like it. You don't have to agree with it. But that's what God says. The salvation that they are going to obtain is found in one place. It is in Christ Jesus and it comes with eternal glory. How long does that glory remain with that believer, with the elect? How long? It's eternal glory. A believer will never be lost. It is eternal glory. Go look it up. The word means forever. It's glory without end. Why? Because the glory belongs to the God of creation, Christ Jesus, the Lord. It is his glory. Not mine. Not yours. You can't earn it. It belongs to God. He says, I will give it to whomever I will. You can't stop it. All right, folks. Now, let's go back to this. So, here's these covenants, folks. And this is so key. And again, I'm going to put Israel up here so that you can understand that this is extremely 
important. Israel. The Abrahamic covenant, and here's your scripture references, Genesis chapter 12, 1 through 9, Genesis chapter 15, 1 through 21. God promised Abraham several things in this covenant. He promised him a land. A very specific land. He even gave him the dimensions of that land. Abraham visited that land. Abraham offered up Isaac in that land. As a matter of fact, on the same mountain range where Jesus Christ was crucified. That's where Abraham took Isaac. God then promised Abraham a nation. What is that nation? That nation is Israel. Again, you don't have to like that. But you got a bigger problem than not liking the Jews. It was God that did that. I would be careful if I was you. God also made Abraham another promise. He offered him personal blessing. What is that? Rich towards God with contentment. The key here is the contentment. The same thing the Bible tells the believer in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. Israel was supposed to be with contentment. That's why you had the Sabbaths in Israel. That's why you had the year of Jubilee where everybody give up everything. Every slave go free. Every debt is canceled. You weren't supposed to charge interest for anything. Everything was come with moderation and contentment. People were going to fall on hard time, but you were supposed to love them and help them. That was the contentment given to Israel. Here in the New Testament, we are supposed to be content. Paul said, whatever state I find myself, therein I would be content. Now, when he talked con contentment in the New Testament, I, I think there, there's some misconception because there's a particular verse that is, is uh, quoted often in, in the New Testament that, that really uh, just is, is totally taken out of context. So I'm going to read two of them to you. So let's go. We're talking about contentment, the second one. And it's, it's a key here, so I'm going to point it out to you. All right, so let's go to Philippians. We're in Timothy. We're already there, so let, let's go. Since we're nearby 1 Timothy, let's just go here. 1 Timothy, I believe, is chapter 6. All right. Look, right here. All right. If anyone teaches otherwise, let me just, uh, all right. Let as many bond servants, slaves, as are under the yoke, count their masters worthy. Why, why do you put this here? Because you need to understand, and I need to understand, both of us, that during the days where Paul was in the Roman Empire, Folks, they said as many as 90% of the people were slaves. I don't know if that's true. I'm just going by what I read in history books. Could be anywhere from 70 to 90%. I have no clue, but that's what, that's what I read. So a lot of people were slaves, folks. Okay? And the slave owners, you, you didn't become... It, sometimes you became free, but most of the times you didn't. All right. So that the name of God and his doctrine may not be blasphemed, that those who have believing masters, let them not despise them because they're brothers. Listen, what is he saying? He's saying, look, just because your master is a believer, now this is coming straight out of the book, folks. Here it is. I'm not, I'm not making it up. Here it is. 
as many bond servants, slaves, this word is slaves, the Bible does not condone slavery, all right? It doesn't condone slavery. But what it does, it transforms both the slave and the slave owner. It does not condone or approve of slavery. So I don't know where people pick that up out of the book, but that is not what this is talking about. Okay? Go read the book of Philemon. I, I, I did a, a study, as a matter of fact, I wrote a book on that. All right? How, how to show God's model of forgiveness. The whole book of Philemon is about this. So God does not condone or approve slavery. He doesn't. What he does is he, God, transforms Slave and the master. Now they're to treat each other as brothers and not owner and slave. The relationship flips. Remember, we were slaves to, to sin. Now we are still slaves, but slaves to righteousness. But the Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus Christ is not ashamed to call us brothers. Now you get what I'm saying? The relationship changes. Not the fact that you are no longer a slave and that the owner should let you go. How can the creator, remember everything in the book is about God. Everything in the book is about Jesus Christ. How can the creator let the creature go? He can't because he owns everything. You will always be a slave to God. It's just a matter of you're going to continue to be a slave to sin where you get the wrath of God or you become a slave of righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ and you become a brother to his son, Jesus Christ. You see, that's the difference. You should never stop being a slave. So this is what this is talking about. That's what I'm telling you. Don't be a surface reader. Don't do that. Understand the whole counsel of God that this is really talking about the relationship that God has with the sinner and how he would treat the sinner who is now in Christ. All right. And those who have believing masters, he says, don't you get upset with the believing master and fussing at him, wanting him to let you go. Why should he do that? Why? He can do it if he want. Christ. Go back. It's Christ. All right. But rather... Serve them. Continue to be the slave because those who are benefited are believers and beloved. Teach and exhort those things. Okay. Now, we don't have this kind of problem mostly in our day because most people, especially here in America, there's no slaves. There used to be, but there's no slaves today. But in nations where there are slaves, that still apply. All right. If anyone teaches otherwise and does not consent to the wholesome words, what wholesome words? The scriptures. Even the words of our Lord. Who told Paul? Jesus Christ. So if you go against that, then you're going against what God said. Not Paul. That's all he's trying to say. And the doctrine which accords, listen, godliness. That's what God is after. Godliness. He is proud, knowing nothing, but is obsessed 
The person who does that is obsessed with disputes and arguments over words, from which comes envy, strife, revel, evil, susceptions, useless wranglings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of truth. Folks, that's unbelievers. Who suppose, now here it is right here. Who suppose, and this is why I got a problem with the prosperity gospel, because everything that you just read here comes out of that kind of preaching. Look at what he says. Who suppose, they suppose that godliness, godlikeness, is a means of gain. Gaining what? Gaining wealth, gaining health, gaining I speak out of my mouth, whatever I want that is, the craziest doctrine I ever heard. Only God can create something out of nothing. And these people are going around saying that they can speak things out of their mouth and make them come to pass, making themselves equal with God. What blasphemy. Paul says, when you see this, that people are teaching and preaching that leads to this stuff, a means of gain of any kind outside of the knowledge of truth, you just read it for yourself. Otherwise, do not consent to wholesome words, the knowledge of truth, the words of Jesus Christ, the doctrine which it caused to God, it's the knowledge of truth. He says, when you see that, when you hear that, what do you do? You withdraw yourself. Get away. You're never going to hear that here. Why? Because he said, don't teach it. It leads to all of this. And all the people that teach that are people who are destitute of truth. They don't understand the book. They have corrupt minds, meaning their motives are corrupt and it's useless. Why? Because all that stuff is perishing anyway. Now, what's my point? Here you go. This is where he wanted you to get. Now, this is an ever-present participle. Now, godliness, all the time, godliness by itself, no. Godliness with contentment. Godliness with contentment. Are you content with your job? Are you content with your pay? Are you content with your car, with your house, with the way your body is? Are you content with your health? Are you content with your lot in life? Godliness with that in the eyes of God is great gain. Get away from that prosperity teaching. It is of the devil. Get away from it. Run as fast as you can. You are better off staying home, reading your own Bible, than going to a place that teaches that garbage. For we brought nothing into this world. And it is certain we can carry nothing out. Now, how many prosperity preachers do you hear teaching this? Please tell me. Having food and clothing. Food and clothing. With these, what these? The these are back to the food and clothing. We shall be content. How in the world do the prosperity teachers, this health, wealth, garbage, demonic mess that they're teaching, can ever come to Timothy chapter 6? and preach this. You can't. They stay far away, far away from that kind of word. 
Why? Because they're deceiving people. But those who desire to be rich, now this rich isn't necessarily just talking about money. You can be wanting to be rich in, in your own mind, you know, in wisdom. Okay, you can be rich in sports. You can be rich in all kinds of things. What he's saying is, you're going to fall into temptation and a snare into many foolish and harmful lusts. Yeah, which drown men in destruction. There's no recovery. And listen to this, perdition. Basically, he's talking about unbeliever folks. A desire for that kind of stuff just simply proves what and who you are. And you're headed for perdition. Do you know who the Bible talks about perdition? He talks about the man of sin, the Antichrist, and Judas. Paul says, if this is you, you're an unbeliever, and you're headed to perdition. For the love, not money, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Man, you, you guys see it. All kind of stuff comes from there. It says, for which some, for what? For which money, which the which is the money, some have strayed from the faith. You see, you got lost? No. Remember what John says? They went out from us because they wasn't all of us. They left because they weren't true believers. They were faking it. And when they had the opportunity to do exactly what the world wants. Listen, anytime you hear preaching concerning things that the unbeliever, unbeliever naturally wants, what does the unbeliever naturally want? They want to be healthy. They want to be wealthy. They want all the, all, they want, you know, Everything the unbeliever want, but they're primarily those two things and everything that comes with that, that's what they want. And you want the gospel to give the unbeliever what they naturally want? No, folks. The gospel, when it's truly preached, rubs the unbeliever wrong. It got Paul sent to jail. Nobody's going to send anybody who's preaching the prosperity gospel to jail. If you're out there preaching that you can be healed by confessing that you're never going to get sick, even though you're sitting here, you know, nose running. You can't breathe. And you say, oh, I'm not sick. Yeah, yeah. What are you then? That's craziness. Okay. I'm not going to speak it on myself. You don't have to speak anything on yourself. Your body is susceptible to sickness. It's called sin. The consequences of that stuff. Can't get rid of it. Live with it. All right. So what God says is, in their greediness. Where did you hear that word at? It's the same word used in Ephesians chapter 2 when he lists off a bunch of sins and he says the unbeliever ran after it with an uncontrollable passion. That's what that word means. So when you see stuff like that, you can clearly know that these folks are not lovers of truth. I didn't write the book, folks. He says, they pierce themselves through with many souls. Why? Because when it don't come true, how many people have you seen giving all kind of money trying to get wealth by giving it to some preacher? They never get wealth. It's the same people saying the same thing over and over and over again. The only people that ever get wealthy is the people receiving the money. People bypassing their light bill, can't pay their medical bill, can't buy their medicine. Money God had already given them to do all those things. What do they do? They give it to some yo-yo who's fleecing them. They're flying around in $100 million jets. And you can't pay your light bill. Save your money. Pay the light bill. Let those hustlers go get their own money. 
Stop doing that mess, folks. He says, stay away from it. You need contentment. All right, let's do one more. And we're gonna, we're gonna move off of this. And this is another piece of the scriptures where people tend to uh, take this one completely out of its context. And this is uh, one where we read in Philippians and it's sitting here at chapter, uh, at uh, verse 11. All right, watch this. So what does he start talking about? He's talking about being anxious. So he's telling you, don't be anxious. Uh, and he says, hey, be united in, in Christ. Here you go, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God will surpass all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So we're going to take everything to prayer. If you want a better job, you can pray about that, folks. That's what the Bible teaches us to do. Does it mean that God's going to give you a better job? No, because what, God, what does he do? If you're witnessing the people at your job, you know what's going to happen. God is going to, you're going to see God running people in and out of that place so that you can tell them the gospel. Then he'll move you around into other locations. And you're going to go tell people the gospel. You're going to move you to another business, maybe. I don't know. Then you're going to tell people the gospel. The next thing you know, he takes you up and he puts you there. So you can tell people the gospel. That's what God is doing. Finally, brothers, whatever things are true, things are normal, things are just pure, lovely, good report, virtue, praiseworthy, meditate on those things. He just described the word of God. The things which you learned and received, heard and saw in me, do those because Paul followed Christ. If you follow Christ, it's okay for you to follow Paul. Now, but I rejoice, watch this, in the light greatly that now at the last care, your care for me has flourished again. Why? Because Paul was in deep trouble in, in Rome at this time. Okay? He was writing us from prison. Surely, now, prison back in those days was not the prisons that you see today. They were dungeons, folks. And Paul was in a dungeon. But you lack opportunity. Not that I speak. Paul says, I don't speak in regard to me. I don't need your money. Paul told the people, I don't need your money. Prosperity preachers will never tell you that. They don't need your money, but they show sure want it. And they ask for it. For I have learned, look at this. Why, Paul? Why don't you need their care, their money? I, Paul, have learned whatever state that I am, look at this, to be content. Paul is practicing what he preached. He was in jail, folks. He was cold. He was hot. I know how to be a base. I know how to live with less. I also know how to abound. I know how to live when I have money. And I'm in good health. Do you read the scriptures and find out everywhere and in all things I have learned have you learned this to be both full and hungry Paul says I don't take advantage of either condition I'm content content Content. Both to abound, listen, suffer need. You never hear a prosperity gospel say that. Prosperity preacher. He ain't suffering nothing. You don't want to suffer. See, Paul says, for Christ, get not the gospel. Whatever state I'm in, whether I'm abound in my suffering need, it's okay. I'm going to be content. Now, this is the verse that people love to quote. Why is Paul quoting it? Paul is quoting it, telling you, 
about contentment. So the context behind which this verse is in there is suffering and being content. Abounding in being content. So Paul says, I can do. He's doing this all things. What is the all things? The all things is suffering. The all things is abounding. The all things is being abased. The all things, again, is abounding. The all things is being content. And the all thing is having needs. So what is he talking about? He's not talking about having a job. He's not talking about going the extra mile. He's talking about being content. Folks, please. This, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What is he strengthening him to do? To be content. To be content. So when you quote this verse, you need to understand what you're saying. That you are going to be content. That when you're sick, it's okay. When you're healthy, it's okay. When the bill is due and you don't have the money, it's okay. When you have way more money then you need to pay the bills. It's okay. Contentment. It's okay. Nevertheless, you have done well that you should share with my distress. You see, Paul was in distress. Paul, the apostle, was in distress. That's his word. Written as prompted by the Spirit of God. Can a believer be under distress? The Apostle Paul was. So why is it that we have people out there preaching, saying that you are in sin when you're under distress? Because they haven't read the book. They're taking things out of, out of context. Take the whole counsel of God. That's all I'm telling you. So, this blessing, we talked about this blessing with contentment, a great name. So God's going to give Abraham a great name. Abraham is known throughout the world for many generations. A worldwide blessing, so a personal blessing in being content with God. And a worldwide blessing in that Abraham's many offsprings among nations and his, uh, through his other sons. Abraham had way more children than Ishmael and uh, uh, Isaac. He had children with Keturah. Okay. As a matter of fact, Midian, remember Midian? Moses' first wife was from where? Midian, one of Abraham's children. And see a blessing. A seed, a seed, this is a seed, sorry. Seed blessing, that's Christ. So God promised Abraham that Christ would come from his loins. All right, now, then you have over in Deuteronomy, God took three chapters to point out this covenant to Israel, a possession of the promised land. This is again to Israel, folks. You can't get past this stuff. God has promised, specific promise to Israel that haven't been fulfilled. You know that have not been fulfilled. You know if he don't do this, then this whole book is a joke and God is a liar and we are still in our sins. This is going to happen. Then you have the Davidic covenant where God again 
promised David a land. He promised David a son. What son? The greater David called Christ the Lord. He promised David a house. What house? The kingdom that Christ is going to rule over forever. Then he promised David a throne. What's that? Christ's glory. The fulfillment of Psalm 2. Folks, that's the covenants. God is not going to renege on his word. He's going to fulfill these things. There's a lot of this stuff that has not been fulfilled. Let me just highlight the ones that haven't been fulfilled yet. Okay? So, almost all the ones that came to Abraham are done. So, this is done. 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 The seed has come. Okay? This one is partial. I'm going to just call it partial. And the reason it's partial because they don't possess the whole land. All right. Now, let's let's get rid of some of this. So this is partial. I'm not gonna. This one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. These are done. I'm just gonna partial. Okay. Now, then you have this one. This is not done. This is not done. This is not completed. Okay. A land, it, this is, it's not as partial, it's not done. Christ the Son, that's done. Christ's kingdom is not done. His glory is not done. Okay, so you have one, two, three, four, five, six that's finished. One, two, three, four, five, that's not finished. So God has to finish this to keep his word. Now, here's the new covenant that we have. Now, the new covenant is really divided into two. There's a new covenant with Israel. Okay? God gives a new covenant to Israel, and then he has a new covenant with the church. So, the new covenant with Israel is coming from Hebrews chapters 8 through 10. I'm not reading it all. I just want to point out a couple of things to you. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Who are you making this new covenant with, Lord? With the house of Israel. God is going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. This is the southern and northern kingdoms. Now, when God bring them back, just like he put them back in the land, they're not in faith in that land, but they need to be in that land so that the end days can happen, the tribulation I'm talking about. But they're in there in unbelief. These are the two kingdoms of Israel, but it's going to be one house called Israel like it is today. And that's what you see with the valley of the dry bones. Not according to, look at this, this other covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke. That's what's happening to Israel today. They broke a covenant. They didn't keep their side. God now is keeping his side of the deal. Go read Leviticus chapter 26 and all the cursing in Deuteronomy. Oh my goodness, it's horrible. And you can clearly see that's exactly what's happening in Israel today. All right, so that's Leviticus 26. That was blessings, but I'm talking more of the curses that God spoke concerning when they broke that covenant. Though I was a husband, God is a husband to them. Who's them? Israel, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with them with the house of Israel, notice, he leaves off Judah. Don't bypass. First he says Israel and Judah. In the end time, it's just Israel. 
as it is today. After those days, what days? What is this? Those days. That's the tribulation. The seven years tribulation. Okay? And also the thousand years millennium. That's what he's talking about. So 1,007 years. We find details of that, that time period right here in Zechariah chapter 13 and 14. I'm not going to read it. You guys can go and do your own homework and read this stuff. Look at what he says he's going to do. And I'm in Jeremiah chapter 31, 31 through 34. I will put, now notice something. Notice this. I will. I will put my laws in their mind and write it on their hearts. What did Israel do? Nothing. I will be their God. What did Israel do? Nothing. And they shall be my people. What did Israel do? Nothing. No more shall every man teach his neighbor. No more preaching. No more synagogues. Every Jew, every man, every Jew, his brother, so no teaching. There won't be any Levites because who was in charge of teaching? The Levites were in charge. And the head of the family was also in charge of making sure, making sure that his family knew the word of God. Know the Lord. For, why Lord? For they all shall know me. How many of them? All. Every Jew is going to be born a believer in the millennium. From, in case you think he's joking, the least of them to the greatest of them. Everyone, God did not misspeak. You heard that correctly. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin. I will remember no more. That's a promise that God have absolute intent and will to fulfill to Israel. This has not happened yet, folks. Israel is not saved today. Israel is not the light that God wants them to be. When he comes back, and they are, Jesus will be here. He will convert them, every single Jew. From that day on, at the end of the tribulation, is going to be born a believer. Now, we're finishing up in Jeremiah chapter 31. Look at what it says here. Thus says the Lord, who gives the sun for light by day, the ordinance of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the sea. So the sun, the moon, the stars, the sea. I created all this stuff. And it's waged war. The Lord of hosts is his name. If those ordinances, the things he listed above here, the sun, the moon, the stars, and the sea, depart from before me, if you can change it, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me. If you can make the sun stop shining, then God's going to renege on his promise to Israel. If you can't, then he won't. If you can stop the moon and the stars from being nights at, at night, lights at night, then you can have God revoke the promises he made in the verses above to Israel. 
If you can control the seas over the Most High God who controls the waves, then Israel will cease to be a nation before the Lord. If not, everything that he promised to Israel is going to come to pass. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above, if the earthly stuff wasn't enough, he now goes to heaven. If it can be measured and the foundations of the earth, now he's talking about the world, can be searched out, it's hanging out there on nothing. Spinning at the right speed, tilted at the right angle, just the right distance from the sun. If you can go search that out and tell God where he fastened it to where it won't be moved, I will also cast off the seed of Israel for all that they have done. Otherwise, forget it, folks. The one race of people that will never be destroyed off the face of this earth is the Jew. The reason why they've been persecuted is because of this word. The devil knows this. If he can kill every single Jew, then this promise can't come to pass. That's why they're having so much trouble. The devil knows this. If he can kill every Jew, and he tried folks over and over and over again. In the book of Esther, it was Haman. In Exodus, it was Pharaoh. In the Gospels, it was Herod. In most recent our days, it was Hitler and now Hamas. What are they trying to do? They're trying to kill the Jews, eliminate the Jews. Why? Because of this promise that God is. You think it's those people? <laughs> You're kidding yourself. No, they don't do them. It's demonic. There's a battle going on where Satan is trying to make God out of a liar. If he can kill every Jew, then Jesus can't fulfill this word, this promise to Israel. There won't be any seed of David. There won't be any promise to, to Abraham. There won't be any of that stuff. What are you doing? There won't be these covenants that we just talked about. All of them fail. Every single one, because there won't be any Jews to possess the promised land. So Deuteronomy 28 through 30, the chapters, goes away. It's no good. Then this promise of Canaan to Abraham fails. Then this promise to David about Christ's kingdom and glory fails in Israel. You understand what's going on? There's a demonic battle happening, folks. Okay. So, I, I need to stop here because we're going to get deeper into um, what's happening with the covenants to the church. So it's probably gonna take a bit more than the time that we have uh, to finish up tonight because it's extensive, people. There's five things. There's the plan. So let me just highlight it and then we'll close up. There's five things with the covenant to the church. There's the plan. There's a preservation or a preservant, preservance of the church. There's the place then there's the palace. Try to make it easy using all P's so that you can see the thing that God has given to the church and then ultimately that's the purpose. Okay? So those are the things that, that oh, sorry, then that's the priesthood. I'll give an outline and that's what we're going to be talking about next time when we come and then we'll, we'll see going to the next one. All right, folks.
that's that's all we have tonight. So I hope you learned something from it that is informative. Uh, and we'll see you next time.